What's going on guys, Justin here and welcome back to our 12th example video following our course on proof writing. Now today's example video is going to be on showing set equality and we're going to be doing that using the method of double inclusion. So in order to prove two sets are equal you have to show that A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. So let's go ahead and apply that for this first example here. So this example says we want to show that the set of all numbers of the form 4k plus 1 for k being an integer is equal to the set of all numbers of the form 4n minus 3 with n being an integer also. So I will be denoting which direction we are going with our inclusion using this symbol here. So in this case I'll be showing that 4k plus 1 is a subset of the 4n minus 3 set. Great, so suppose we have some element m that is in the set 4k plus 1 for k being an integer. Well then that means that m is congruent to 1 mod 4 as it is 1 more than a multiple of 4 and we can see that that will be congruent to negative 3 mod 4 as those are just the same but that means that we can rewrite m as 4k minus 3 but as you can see, that is of the form that we have here on the left, which means that m is in the set 4n minus 3, where n is an integer. Great. So let's do the reverse direction. So for the reverse direction, we are going to do the same thing we did last time, but for the right-hand side. So we're going to suppose that m is in the set 4n minus 3 for an integer n. And that means that we can write m as congruent to negative 3 mod 4. But just as before, that will be congruent to 1 mod 4, which means that we can write m as 4 times k plus 1, which of course means that m is in the set 4k plus 1 for some integer k. Great. And since we've shown that the left-hand side is a subset of the right-hand side and the right-hand side is a subset of the left-hand side, we have showed that these two sets are equal. So let's go ahead and get into our next proof. All right, so this one says for any sets A and B, we want to show that A minus B is equal to A intersect B complement. So let's begin by doing our forward direction here. So let's suppose we have an element X that is in A set minus B. What does that mean? Well, that means that X is in A and X is not in B. But if X is not in B, that means that X must be in B complement. And if X is in A and X is in B complement, that means X is in the intersection of A and B complement. So that completes our forward direction. So let's go ahead and do our reverse direction, starting on the right-hand side this time. So we're going to suppose that X is in A intersect B complement. Well, what does that mean? That means that X is in A and X is in B complement. But if X is in B complement, that implies that X is not in B. And if X is in A and not in B, that means X is in A minus B. So that completes our reverse direction and that completes our second example. So let's go ahead and get into the third one. All right, so for this one, we want to prove that the set of all numbers of the form 7m plus 10n for integers m and n is the same as the set of all integers. So let's begin by doing the forward direction for our double inclusion here. Now this should be pretty easy to prove. So let's go ahead and suppose that x is an element of our set 7m plus 10n for integers m and n. Well, that means we can express x in the, in the following way. We can write it as 7a plus 10b for integers a and b. But if we are adding multiples of two different integers, it is impossible for x to not be an integer, which means that x is in the set of all integers. Great, so that finishes our forward proof. So for our reverse proof, we're going to have to get a little more creative, but we're going to start by supposing that x is in the set of all integers. And then from here, we are going to note, we can express the number 1 in the following way, where we have 7 times 3 plus 10 
times negative 2. Great. And then we're going to multiply both sides of this equation by x. So then we'll have x is equal to 7 times 3x plus 10 times negative 2x. But we can see that this is of the form of our left-hand side of the equation. We have x is equal to 7 times 1 integer, 3x, and that's going to be plus 10 times a different integer, negative 2x. So that means that x belongs to our set 7m plus 10n for integers m and n, which completes our reverse for our double inclusion, and that completes this example. So let's go ahead and get into our next proof. So for this one, we want to show that the set of all numbers of the form 4m for m being an integer intersect the set of all numbers of the form 6m for m being an integer is equal to the set of all numbers of the form 12n for n being an integer. So let's go ahead and begin with the forward direction here. So we're going to suppose we have x, which is an element of our intersection here, which is 4m for m being an integer. That's going to be intersect the set of all numbers of the form 6m for m being an integer. Well, what does that mean? That means we can write x in two different ways. We can express x as a multiple of 4, so I'll write x as 4 times l. And we can express it as a multiple of 6, so I'll write x is equal to 6 times h, where l and h are going to be integers. Great. Well, we can go ahead and set those two equal to each other. So we'll have 4l is equal to 6h. And we're going to go ahead and divide by 2, so that means that 2L is equal to 3H. But that means that 3 times H is even. But as 3 is an odd number, that must mean H is even, so that means that we can write H as 2 times something else. So we'll write it as 2A for A being an integer. And we'll go ahead and plug that into this definition here for X, so that will mean that X is equal to 6 times 2 times A which we can write as 12 times a. And since x is now equal to 12 times an integer, that means it is an element of the right-hand side there. So that means that x is an element of the set of all numbers of the form 12 times n for all integers n. Great, so let's go ahead and do our reverse direction now. So let's start by supposing that x is an element of the set 12n for all integers n. So that means we can write x as a multiple of 12, so write it as 12 times l. But we can write 12 times l in two different ways. That means we can write x is equal to 4 times 3l, and x is also equal to 6 times 2l. But because we can express x as a multiple of 4 and an integer, that means that x is in our intersection that we have there on the left. So that means that x is in this, the intersection of the sets 4m for all integers m, intersect 6m for all integers m. Great. Since we've done our forward and reverse, we have completed this set equality proof. So let's go ahead and get into our next one. So for this one, we want to show that the infinite intersection across all natural numbers n of negative 1 over n squared and n plus 1 over n is equal to the closed interval 0, 1. So let's begin with the reverse direction for this one. So we're going to suppose that x is an element of our closed interval 0, 1. Then since x is on the closed interval 0, 1, we can bound it in the following way where we have 1 over n squared on the left-hand side and n plus 1 over n on the right-hand side. And this will be for all natural numbers n. But this, by definition, means that x is on the open interval from negative 1 over n squared to n plus 1 over n for all natural numbers n. But that, of course, means that x is in our intersection that we want. So that means that x is on the... In intersection across all natural numbers n of negative 1 over n squared and n plus 1 over n. Great. So let's go ahead and do our forward direction. So just like before, we're going to suppose that x is in our intersection. I'm just going to abbreviate like that like this so I don't have to write it out. Well, if x is in our intersection, then that means that x is in our open interval negative 1 over n squared and n plus 1 over n for all natural numbers n. And that, of course, means that we can bound x in the following way. So that means that x will be between negative 1 over n squared and n plus 1 over n for all natural numbers n. And from here, to arrive at the interval we want, we are going to do it by way of contradictions. So 
we are going to show that for x less than 0 and x greater than 1, we arrive at contradiction. So let's begin by uh, assuming x is greater than 1. So we still have this bounding above here for x. So let's go ahead and draw this on a number line. So that means on the left hand side here we'll have a 1. Then we can go a ways and we'll have x which is arbitrarily between 1 and then we'll have n plus 1 over n here on the far side as an upper bound for x. Now before we get into this I want to go ahead and note that n plus 1 over n is equal to 1 plus 1 over n as you can split the n plus 1 over n into n over n plus 1 over n. So let me go ahead and put that in a box here because I'm going to probably use these two synonymously for the rest of this proof. So next we want to note that as n goes to infinity, 1 plus 1 over n goes to 1. So that means for a large enough n, we will have the following inequality, where x is greater than 1 plus 1 over n. But we're going to have to prove that we have a sufficiently large n. But we can rewrite that as follows. So that means that x minus 1 is greater than 1 over n. But that means that n is greater than 1 over x minus 1. But by the Archimedean principle, that means that there exists a natural number n such that n is greater than 1 over x minus 1. But that means x minus 1 is greater than 1 over n, which of course means that x is greater than 1 plus 1 over n, which is a contradiction. And we, what did we contradict? Well, we contradicted our established bounding for x. So let me go ahead and erase this, and we can get into when x is less than 0. Great, so next we are going to assume that x is less than 0. And just like before, we will draw a number line for that. So down here we will have negative 1 over n squared. Then somewhere in the middle here we'll have x, and then all the way up here for an upper bound we will have 0. And then we want to observe as n goes to infinity, negative 1 over n squared will go to 0. Thus for a sufficiently large n, we can write that x is less than negative 1 over n squared. And then all we have to do is prove we have that sufficiently large n. So let's go ahead and solve for n here. So this means that x is greater than 1 over n squared, which means that the square root of x is greater than 1 over n. But that means that n is greater than 1 over the square root of x. And by the Archimedean principle, we know that there exists an n such that n is greater than 1 over the square root of x. But that, of course, means that the square root of x is greater than or equal to 1 over n, which means that x is greater than 1 over n squared, which means that x is less than negative 1 over n squared. But that is a contradiction. And what did we contradict? We contradicted our bounding for x. So from these two proofs from contradiction, that means that x is not less than 0, and x is not greater than 1, which means that x is on the closed interval 0 to 1. Great, so that completes this proof. So let's go ahead and get to a next one. Great, so for this problem we want to prove that the infinite union for x from 1 to infinity of the closed interval 3 plus 1 over x and 7 minus 1 over x is equal to the open interval 3, 7. So let's begin by doing our forward direction. So let's suppose that y is in our union, which I'll just denote with this big U. Well, then that means that y is in our interval 3 plus 1 over x and 7 minus 1 over x for some x from 1 to infinity. Great. So from here we want to note that as x goes to infinity, 3 plus 1 over x goes to 3, and 7 minus 1 over x will go to 7. So that means we can bound y in the following way, where we have that 3 is strictly less than 3 plus 1 over x, which is less than or equal to y, which is less than or equal to 7 minus 1 over x, which is less than 7, which of course means that y is on the open interval 3, 7, as we have bounded it as such. 
So that completes our forward proof there. So let's go ahead and get into our reverse proof. So for a reverse proof, we're gonna begin by supposing that Y is an element of the open set three, seven. And what we need is we want to find an X on the interval one to infinity such that Y is on the closed interval three plus one over X to seven minus one over X. So let's begin by looking at our upper bound. So for upper bound, we will need Y is less than or equal to seven minus one over X, but that will happen if and only if Y minus seven is less than or equal to negative one over X, which is if and only if seven minus Y is greater than or equal to one over X. But that means that X is greater than or equal to one over seven minus Y but we can prove that such an X exists using the Archimedean principle, which I'll write as AP. So there exists an X on the interval one to infinity, such that our inequality holds X is greater than or equal to one over seven minus Y. And since we know such an X exists, we can retrace our steps back to this first step, which will bound our Y above by seven minus one over X. Great, so let's go ahead and look at our lower bound. So for our lower bound, we will need y to be greater than or equal to three plus one over x, but that will happen if and only if y minus three is greater than or equal to one over x. And that's if and only if x is greater than or equal to one over y minus three. We can prove the existence of that x using the Archimedean principle as before. So there exists an x on our interval one to infinity, such that our inequality holds x is greater than or equal to one over y minus three. And once again, we can retrace our steps to show that that means that y is greater than or equal to three plus one over x. And since we have bounded y in the following way, where three plus one over x is less than or equal to y, which is less than or equal to seven minus one over x, that means that y is on our closed interval three plus one over x to seven minus one over x, which is exactly what we wanted to show for this reverse proof. So that completes this proof here. So let's go ahead and get into the next problem. So for this one, given sets A, B, and C, we wanna prove that A cross B minus C is equal to A cross B minus A cross C. So let's begin by doing our forward direction here. So we're gonna suppose we have the ordered pair X and Y, and then that is going to be in X cross B minus C. So let's go ahead and break down the cross product first. So that is going to mean that X is in A, and that Y is in B minus C. Well, X is in A is as simple as we can get, so let's go ahead and look at Y is in B minus C. Well, what does that mean? That means that Y is in B, and Y is not in C. But that means our ordered pair X and Y is going to be in the cross product of A cross B, but X, Y is not going to be in a cross C. But we can combine these two facts to get our right hand side there. <clears throat> so that means that X, Y is an element of A cross B minus A cross C. Great, so let's go ahead and get into our reverse proof. So let's begin by supposing that X, Y is an element of A cross B minus A cross C. Well, what does that mean? Let's take it one at a time. Let's start with A cross B here. So that means that X is in A and Y is in B. But it also means that the ordered pair X, Y is not in A cross C. But since X is in A and X, Y is in A cross B, that must mean that Y is not in C. But since we have that Y is in B and Y is not in C and X is in A, that must mean that X, Y is in A cross B minus C. So that completes our reverse direction and that finishes this last proof off and that's a good place to stop.